Right, welcome. This is my presentation on community policing. Throughout my presentation, I'll be discussing a range of topics, but as we get there, we'll cover each uh, different section. So just to introduce the beginning of the PowerPoint, um, the presentation is going to discuss community policing in a range of different ways, some mostly obvious ways as how we perceive community policing, but also ways that uh, you wouldn't initially see community policing to be. Um, I'll also discuss the difference between community policing in two separate areas, um, but within the same force. Um, on top of all of that, I'll also cover some of the social care aspects, uh, some of the social media and different agencies that work to reach communities, etc, etc. So what is community policing? So um, by definition, community policing is uh, the system of allocating police officers to particular areas so that they become familiar with the local inhabitants. Um, but in more basic terms, it's uh, the act of dedicating specific officers to an area so that they get a better and more fuller understanding of those who live there and the situations that they deal with on the daily. Um, it's not as proactive and in the face as hotspot policing and it's not as fast paced as response policing but it is very technical and does link into evidence based policing which I will cover later on. Um, so reassurance policing that's part of uh, community policing as a whole and there is um, some interesting stats on reassurance policing um, and the, the phrase of reassurance policing is really to focus in what we call the reassurance gap, which is when the public believe that there is a rise in crime, there is a higher fear of crime, they're more uncomfortable, um, but there is actually a decrease in the crime rate. Uh, so it's the gap between what people perceive and what the actual crime stats are. Um, so the aim of reassurance policing and community policing is to sort of give the public a better idea um, of what's going on and make them feel a lot safer um, because there's no uh, need for excess worry when the crime rates are going the opposite direction to what they believe. Um, so as very briefly mentioned before, evidence-based policing does tie into community policing. Um, it's a very large topic on its own. But uh, to sum up very simply, evidence-based policing is sort of the gathering of um, various methods of uh, evidence regarding crime or issues within a police force. Um, and it uses all this evidence and all this information to structure a plan as to how they can fix the problem or solve the problem or find a way to decrease whatever is that happening. Um, so that links quite heavily to, uh, to community policing um, because within the community when we're looking to police a certain aspect uh, it's really important to get lots of information from those who are in the community as well as other sources so evidence-based policing and community policing do go quite hand in hand. So community interaction and social media. So there are various different communities uh, within any given area and it's important to note that a community isn't just the, the place that people live but it's also different subcultures and stuff. So for example, uh, the types of music you're into or the way you might identify uh, sexually for example, um, that can put you in a different community. Uh, religious reasons or um, ethnic background might put you in other communities and you'll be in one community of where you live but separate smaller communities with who you associate with. Um, and this can be quite difficult to communicate to everyone because not everybody is listening to the same podcast or the same music station or looking at the same websites online so it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly how to target one group of people especially when you're looking at a geographical area there could be loads and loads of diversities within that area so it's quite hard to pinpoint one um, so social media is a very good outlet there are lots of different platforms where lots of different people um, associate themselves so for example the older generation can mainly be found on places like Facebook and Twitter um, they've been around a little bit longer and they're more catered to um, people who might not be as tech savvy um, whereas the younger generation 
are more on sort of Instagram, Snapchat, and some of the alternative groups and LGBT community can be found a lot on TikTok. Um, so by having more of a diverse social media presence, it can kind of hit each community. Um, as well as like religious and local, like there might be a chance that unless there's a local community group for the area you live in, there's not really a chance they're all going to share one social space online. Um, so lots of face-to-face -face interactions, door knocking, leaflets, letters, that's a good way to reach that side of the community. Um, but it just shows that the internet is very, very good for reaching a wide range of people. So um, leading on from a diverse community, there's also a diverse workforce. So um, the importance of a diverse workforce is massive for a multitude of reasons. Not only does it show the public um, that the police are fair and equal, but it also gives young people or people of all ages um, someone to look up to that they may relate to. But most importantly in regards to community policing is the way that the community engage with the officers. And there's a quote here from Ryan Tillman that states, if I go to deal with somebody that's in the minority community, I can relate to them because we're the same race and that's going to automatically de-escalate faster as opposed to somebody that can't relate. So this shows that if somebody is relating to the officers they're dealing with, whether it be from any type of community or subculture, there may be a chance that it's much easier to reason with them, much easier to get an understanding, to be friendly. Um, and in this case, as Ryan states, it is actually safer. It, it's good for a de-escalation tool, which is very important in a dangerous role as policing. Um, so comparing, uh, comparing communities within Bedfordshire is the next step. Um, so the first place I looked at was um, Houghton Regis and Rural. Uh, the, um, the Beds Police have a dedicated team that focuses on uh, the communities that it works in. One of them uh, focuses on Houghton Regis and on the Beds Police website there is a, a very handy little tool that allows you to put in a postcode which will give you the um, crime stats on the area that you've put in. And when you put in the postcode for Houghton Regis, it comes up with various crimes, but most importantly, the top crime is antisocial behaviour, as well as um, violence and sexual offences. Um, and this web page includes lots of important information to do with how crime teams work, how the community teams work, and also it sets out the plan that they have in mind for what they want to do in the community and at the top of that it's cracking down on antisocial behaviour. So it shows that in this postcode in particular, which is quite a rural um, and relatively quiet town, it shows that antisocial behaviour with a lot of the younger kids is quite high, which moves on to uh, the broken windows theory. So. Um, linking in heavily with community policing um, and the theoretical side behind it. The broken windows theory is a prime example, especially in regards of antisocial behaviour, of how the appearance of a place can uh, subsequently affect the crime rate. So the idea is that if a place looks like it's been riddled with crime or mal maltreated or um, that they could get away with it, um, there is more chance of crime occurring, whereas if it would have been nice, um, doled up, very tidy, clean, uh, there's less chance of crime. Um, so in regards of community policing, working with teams such as the local council, um, it's really good to be able to sort of fundraise or promote um, messages out there for people to keep a tidier space, you know, more lighting, less broken glass and damage to keep up more of a, a crime-free look to therefore reduce the actual crime rate overall. The second place I looked at in Bedfordshire was Luton and East. So Luton Town is a much larger town than Houghton Regis and it's also a lot more urban, um, which led to a different roster of crimes on the list. So at the top was still um, violence and sexual offences and antisocial behaviour, but there was also a very, very large importance noted on the drug crime issue in the area, um, which could be related to the architecture or to um, the sheer population size in comparison to Houghton Regis. Um, so despite 
violence, sexual crimes and antisocial behaviour both being at the top of the list, it's actually drugs that are the main priority for the community teams. So in comparison, uh, they're both different vastly in size and architecture, um, urban, rural, and both have very different focuses for their uh, crime teams. Um, this um, may come down to various different reasons, but it's also important to note that there is a difference in diverse population. So um, Luton Town is approximately 55% inhabited by black and ethnic minority groups, whereas Houghton Regis is only 10%. Um, so this shows that um, the community policing teams are going to deal with different people from different towns um, despite being so close and so linked there is a really really big gap between the people they're dealing with so it does really show the important importance of a diverse workforce so operational engagement so putting the theory into practice um, so Operation Skepta, this was a community policing team slash um, knife crime team that worked together to prevent um, knife crime from occurring and to work on disposing of weapons. So throughout Bedfordshire there are weapons disposal bins that are located to allow people to anonymously and safely discard of any weapons they have. Um, so they promoted this week of action where they were going to crack down on knife crime and just before the week of action they emptied the bins and found over 3,000 blades and 14 firearms. After they did that they emptied all the bins, they did their weekend, uh, sorry their week of campaigning, they talked to schools, they engaged with local retailers about the selling of knives and they really publicised the dangers of knife crime. They got right in with the community and did as much as they could to promote this message um, and then at the end they emptied the bins again and found further knives um, and they made some arrests and after doing searches and stuff just to sort of spread the message of clearing knives and the fact that they managed to empty the bins and get more knives out of it in only a week shows that there was a bit of success with their promotion because people had gone to dispose of these knives. Um, another really really important role within community policing is the role of a PCSO also known as a police community support officer. Um, so a PCSO is a member within the force who doesn't have the same uh, warrant powers as a regular officer um, but they still have you know full uniform and they are active in the community. Their role is to get really close to the, the people in the neighbourhood, the different communities, to engage and to be friendly, to learn all about what's going on in the situation, uh, what sort of crimes are issues and the people that are vulnerable in the area. And the knowledge that a PCSO can gain from being really close to these communities is very, very vital going forward looking at other operations such as Operation Skepta. So to conclude, um, every community has different and individual needs and each community has a vast range of people in it. Um, so it's really important to understand the community that the police work in. Um, so having these roles such as a PCSO role um, and these community teams that are actively engaging with their community is very, very important, especially as communities can change quickly, um, different people can move, uh, there's lots of ups and downs with crime rates and with fear. It's really important to stay constantly engaged and that's why community teams are so vital, um, especially the PCSO role who gains so much knowledge from speaking to these people. Um, but it also shows that there's theory behind it, such as the broken windows theory and evidence-based policing side of stuff, that shows a lot of work can be done behind the front lines that will benefit greatly by analysing that data and understanding what's going on in the community. Um, it is important to note as well that uh, these websites online that reach out to the community, such as the Beds Police website that displays the, uh, the needs of the community and displays the the ideas that the police are working towards. It also has a complete transparency, it shows who's on the team, who's working there and it's also got survey links for people to speak up 
about how they feel. So these online areas and these uh, social presences are also really important to reach those who wouldn't normally interact with the police. Overall, community policing is incredibly important to the grand scheme of things when it comes to policing, especially with making people feel safe. Um, and when there is a really healthy balance between the theory and the practical, it's when it's at its most effective. Thank you very much for listening to my PowerPoint. Um, that was community policing.